Hey everybody, welcome back to Matt Money. It's another episode with your boy, Uncle Matt. So let's hop right into today's discussion. We're actually going to be talking about the number seven position within the dividend investing portfolio here on YouTube. So let's just hop right into the overview of the portfolio, then we'll actually talk a lot about what the number seven stock is. So quick portfolio overview, and I'll probably zoom in here for you guys really quick. Current portfolio value as of July 7th of 2020 is $464,000, of which we're looking at the $317,000 in the dividend investing portfolio. That's throwing off about $15,156 in dividend income in the next four to 12 months. Now, of course, you guys probably know my goal for the year is about $14,000. Uh, obviously, we're already through five, six months of the year. So we're looking at hopefully getting that additional $100 in here to get my $14,000 goal for dividend income in 2020. So fingers crossed. Keep your hopes up for me. Hope that Wells Fargo dividend cut in seven days is not that bad. So hopping actually back into what we're looking at today, we're going to be talking about an energy stock. So let's just do a quick highlight here. Brief overview of energy. So energy accounts for about $3,600 worth of the income coming from the portfolio. So about $300 a month. 24% of the portfolio comes from energy, and it's currently about $42,000 worth of invested capital, or the value of the capital, rather. Of course, I probably have invested a lot more capital than $42,000, but a lot of my energy positions at the moment are currently down. They account for just under 14% of the total portfolio in terms of the value at the moment and the yield as of today is about 8.6 percent it was higher before shell had cut the dividend now jumping specifically into the capital allocation by sector let's just do a little quick comparison we already talked about the capital allocation of the income being about 13 percent and 24 percent respectively so let's just do a quick overview and if you guys have been watching the videos you're probably familiar with what the allocation is if you've looked at 10 9 8 and now 7. so consumer staples about 8.7 percent energy fits right after that 19 percent coming from financials real estate's about 17 percent 8.6% for healthcare, 9.2% for industrials, 5.2% for information technology, and the remainder goes to materials, telecom, cash, and some ETFs as well, and consumer discretionary. So you can see the majority of the portfolio is taken up by energy, financials, and real estate for about 50% of the portfolio. And then if you actually include consumer staples, healthcare, and industrials, it's about 75, maybe even more percent of the entire portfolio. Um, hopping right over to income, you can see income is the, one of the largest part of the pies here at 24% of the total income from the portfolio coming from energy stocks. Now, what I want to highlight here is if you were to look at the S&P 500, energy stocks account for a very small portion of the S&P 500. So comparing this to the S&P 500, you would see that I am drastically underweight in information technology stocks. If you were to kind of look at allocation from capital. We'd also see the massive over allocation to energy stocks. Hopping around in a clockwise fashion, as always, consumer staples accounts for just under 11% of the income, 24% for energy, as we've mentioned before, under 22% for financials, real estate's just under 19, and then the remaining, I guess, 25% is split amongst healthcare, industrials, materials, telecom, cash, utilities, and ETFs as well. Uh, you guys know I'm trying to get the ETF contributions up, and as soon as the in energy aspect of things kind of starts leveling out and energy sector kind of starts coming back to normal, I will be probably selling off a decent amount of that to be investing into some of these smaller, unappreciated, allocated sectors here. One thing that I do want to mention, though, is the ETFs that I have are heavily focused in information technology. So while this 5.2% might seem like a small amount, this is really only counting for my Google, my Amazon, and like a first solar position, and maybe even a little bit of Visa as well. What it's not accounting for is the percentage that's coming in from the ETFs. I invest in QQQ, I invest in ITOT, those two mostly. So I think that those are heavily invested in the NASDAQ 100 and S&P 500, 
which are mostly weighted towards information technology stocks. So for those of you guys that think that I'm way underweight in internet information technology, you're right. Uh, but it is being boosted up by some of these ETFs that I'll continue to invest in throughout time. Now, without further ado, let's just hop right into the top 10 energy stock. So you guys probably already could believe this, but we're talking about ExxonMobil. Uh, current price of Exxon is about $43 a share. We're down pretty substantially over the past couple months. Uh, reason being is I've been buying Exxon for quite a, quite some time now. Uh, if we just kind of look specifically at the shares that I had bought in the past, I had bought about 101 shares back at about 75 bucks or so as well. And uh, recently bought about another $5,000 worth of shares when the price hit about $50. And so that brings my average cost basis down to $64. And I mean, that just doesn't cut it. You know what I mean? So uh, current price at the moment is just over 43 bucks. So that being said, you know, I, I definitely should potentially take a little bit more, I guess, opportunity to reinvest some of the capital that I get and the dividends that I get into Exxon, uh, but at the same time, I'm so, already so over allocated to energy stocks that, you know, I'm probably just going to be holding this one for the long-term dividend in the future anyway. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's all there is to be said about that at the moment. Current annual payout from Exxon for me is about $717, just based off the fact that I have 206 shares. Current cost basis of it is about $12,600, and it's currently valued at just under $9,000. You can see that this was currently uh, top seven, but at the same time, you can see now that some of these other companies now are outweighing this, actually. So actually, the top nine, eight, ten are actually uh, costing a lot more in terms of value than the number seven position because energy continues to struggle in this current environment. So $3.48 per share from dividends, and that's about an 8% yield at the moment, which is astronomically high for Exxon. Yield on cost based off of that $63, $64, $65 cost basis is 5.39%. You could expect an $0.87 cents per quarter, and every time I get paid out, it's about $179. So can't complain with that bad boy. Current market cap is about $182 billion. Earnings per share obviously is impacted heavily by the current environment that we're in in oil and gas as well. Price to earnings also being impacted by the, the current environment that we're in as well. You can see that the 52-week high is about $77, so we're 44% down from that. And the 52-week low actually hit $30, and we're about 43% up from there but we are closer to this $30 than we are to that 52 week high um, you can see that we are a little bit more volatile than the S&P 500 being 1.33 compared to the one that the S&P 500 would have I own about 0.0000049% of the company so very little ownership of the company at the moment and there's about 4.2 billion shares outstanding now want to talk a little bit about the reasons why I invest in Exxon and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they have a really good position in both Permian and Guyana and if you guys haven't seen a lot of their investor presentations I'm just going to pull up two slides and we'll get a little bit more into the financials but what I want to highlight is the sort of position that they've had. They've invested a lot into the Permian. They've invested a lot in Guyana. And I think that these are going to be huge cash flow generators for them in the long term, allowing them to lower their cost dollar per barrel that they get out of the ground. So their lifting costs are going to go down the more that they invest in these assets. And I think that the stronger of a, of a hold they have in these prime assets for the next 20, 30 years is just their ability to maximize cash flow. Think of it as almost like a an assembly line, the way that they'll try to basically make sure that they get all the cost efficiencies that they can within this environment that they're looking for in the Permian in Guyana. So when the cost is kind of limited, the top line revenue is kind of limited, you have to look at the efficiencies you can make at the bottom line, whether that's you know operating costs, whether that's capital expenditures, to make sure that you bring home enough for your shareholders and to make sure that you have enough to invest capital back into the business. So, I mean, just looking 
pretty quickly. You can see just in the quick two years that they've had, they've almost doubled production from 2018 to what they expect in 2020 in the Permian. And then looking forward as well, we're looking at about 100,000 barrels a day net to Exxon. And then just in the next two years, they're going to bring that up to close to 350,000 a day. And every two years thereafter, they're going to bring on another drill ship. That'll allow them to produce potentially another 200,000 barrels a day. And hopefully by the time you get to mid decade here, 2026, 2027, they'll be producing close to a million barrels out of four or five different FPSOs. And that is huge, right? One basin where they have a huge advantage in in the ownership of it, and they've had a great cost basis, a great government relationship. The government currently is trying to renegotiate the terms just based off the discoveries that they had found. And what I do want to highlight is a little bit of the, I guess, history of Guyana and what kind of happened. So Guyana actually was, I mean, just quickly, here's like all the different discoveries that they have to date in Guyana for specifically for ExxonMobil and Hess is the partner. But you could see just quickly in 2009 to 2012, they had a lot of different third parties, so different companies drill dry holes. So there's about 40 different dry holes that were drilled around the Starbrook block that Exxon has interest in. And Exxon decided to come in and look at a prospect and they said, hey, you know, this looks like it conforms to structure with an interpreted seismic indication that there's a, an oil water contact here. And so they drilled it and boom, you know, they have a, a phenomenal uh, success there at Liza and they're actually drilled it. And then you could see that they just went off to the races and really just started drilling Liza, Liza Deep and a bunch of other different opportunities that are there. And you can see that they actually started developing it as soon as they found Liza to see how many different blocks that they could do. They would delineate it. And you get to see that at the moment, they already have four drill ships in basin, three different exploration wells planned for just the end of last year. And all three of those, if I remember correctly, which were like Mako and, uh, and Ural and, and a bunch of other of those ones, they turned out phenomenally. Uh, they, they both came out really good. And the numbers that I'm actually going to show you if they're in here or not. So maybe they're not in here right now, but what I do want to share with you is the prospects, right? So they had one drilled in back in 2015, which the Eliza was, and they basically have just been honing in on their seismic and subsurface strategy associated with everything, figuring out what kind of amplitudes they're looking for or what type of downhole indicators they're looking for in seismic to be able to make their decisions on what they're going to drill. And since they've kind of drilled and delineated the basin here, at least in the Starbrook block, they've been able to hone in on the different prospects. And so you can see that they've drilled about 12 to 15 different prospects at the moment. They've come up extremely great as of the 2020 timeframe here. And they've continued to just destroy it, right? Now, from what I've seen, they've had, they have over 60 different prospects that they're tr currently trying to either drill or develop. And that's just astounding. And they're obviously the basin leader within Guyana at the moment. What I also want to highlight is just this quick overview here where they've gone from the Liza discovery, which was about a billion barrels in place to about a billion and a half to about 3 billion with different discoveries that they had in 2017. 2018, they had another couple billion and 2019, this got up to about six, six and a half billion. With the further discoveries that they've had since early 2020, they've actually es es estimated they've actually estimated that they're recoverable from Guyana, specifically for what the discoveries that they have in this area are about eight billion barrels, and they haven't even drilled some of these other blocks that they have uh, on lease as well. So you can see they also have Kanji and Kator. I don't know if that's how you necessarily pronounce those names, but they haven't even started drilling on these particular blocks. And there is also prospectivity that other companies have seen uh, in the blocks directly to the east of Starbrook. And so, yeah, I think that uh, I think that it's a really good opportunity for folks to really look at, you know, Guyana and the reason why. So I think a lot of people are saying, well, you know, Exxon's not really doing so great with their cash flow right now. And we'll look a little bit more about that in just a second. But I think that that is part of the reason why. And we can talk a little bit more about it once we get to the CapEx that they're kind of spending. So looking specifically, we looked and we saw that about $182 billion in market cap. PE is about 16. So that's not any different from what the Google Finance Sheet said. Earnings per share about 2.66 
for the trailing 12 months. You can see we're coming up on earnings at the end of the month here, and the yield is just under 8% based off of what we kind of have. You can see the one-year target estimate is about $47. So right now, based off of what we kind of see and the environment that we're in in oil and gas, it's roughly decently valued. So it's not anywhere like anyone's expecting it to shoot to the moon or anything like that uh, over the next couple months. But if we kind of just take a quick look at the past five years or so, or max years, you can see from 95, we were at about $20 a share. We went up to close to over $100 a share. This is when Warren Buffett was buying in. And now you can see due to the, due to the pandemic, we're obviously taking a huge impact coming all the way from $75, which is when I initiated my position over the past couple of years down to the about $43 at the moment. So, um, based off of this, you can see I'm down pretty substantially, uh, over the past couple of years, but I'm just going to keep holding. I think it's a great dividend pair. And uh, I think that it's got a lot of potential in the future as other companies transition out. And we can talk about that maybe in a different video. Specifically looking at income, let's just take a quick look here. So we know that coming out of 2015, 2016 with the most recent downturn before we kind of had this pandemic going on, you can see they're really trying to get their footing back and net income coming out of that was about $8 billion. So they were able to be cash flow positive associated with that and actually make a profit back then. And you can see it's kind of hung around the $19, $20 billion when we got into 2017, 2018. And then now it started to dip again in 2019 as commodity prices started to dip again. And you can see just based off the most recent quarter, it's gone down again, uh, even though the revenue is up there that we're down to about 11 billion in terms of trailing 12 months earnings. So taking a quick look, the gross profit looks phenomenal, right? Um, going from about 40 billion in gross profit to about 55 to about 67 in gross profit as oil price recovered in 2018. And now it's started to kind of teeter off again based off of what we're kind of seeing in the price environment going on in the world. And what I want to highlight quickly is if we just kind of take a quick look at the shareholder equity for Exxon Mobil, we had about $183 billion company. If you were to get rid of everything and, and everything were to be true, there weren't any write-offs associated with the assets in here, you'd be able to walk away with about, you know, an additional nine or so return on your money, right? So if you think about it, company's worth $183 billion in terms of the share price. But if we were to liquidate everything, company's worth $191 billion. Now, of course, I think that there's probably some things in here that would get written down specifically like goodwill and stuff like that. But another thing that I wanted to look at in terms of profitability of the organization is what's the real, I guess, liability and stockholder equity really generating them in terms of returns every single year. And so if you're looking at this, it's about $362,000 so dollars. And if you were to look specifically at what kind of net income you'd be getting, it'd be about $14 billion. But of course, that is a little bit after taxes and stuff like that. So if you look at income before taxes, you could see it's about $20 billion worth of cash here. So you could see that it's not that great, right? I mean, you're looking at anywhere between a 5 to 10% return on capital employed, which, you know, not that great. I mean, if you were to kind of look at specifically like a, a gross profit aspect of things and you were to kind of subtract out these operating expenditures, I mean, it's it's not looking too great. Um, you do have their OBO, what I assume is their OBO business kind of coming in here, providing about the nine to eight billion dollars a year in cash flow that is allowed to kind of drip into the company and give them a boost. But just the things that they're operating at the moment, I mean, you can see it's not looking too hot. You know what I mean? You're, you have $360 billion out there and you're only able to bring back about 20 to 30 billion, which is below 10% return on capital employed. You can see it's not really high returns. Um, you know, it, it's not like what it used to be where you might be able to get, you know, 15 to 20% returns on some of these investments. And I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of capital being deployed in the early 2000s and leading into the 2008 to 2014 time frame where prices were up in the 80 to $100 barrel range. And I think that a lot of capital got deployed during those times and they're really just waiting for a lot of those projects to continue to produce out. And until they invest more capital at these lower cost bases, it's, it's going to continue to be a struggle to be able to get the returns that they were expecting and planning on. So in terms of cash flow, let's just take a quick look here. 
So we know that walking away from everything from, you know, a net profit and DDNA sort of perspective, everything kind of adds back up to the 30 or so billion dollars in terms of what they can expect out of the company. Sometimes it's low, 22 billion back in 2016 when they were recovering from the from the recent dip and then 36 billion when we were kind of at the high, most recent highs back in 2018. And now you can see we're starting to dip back again to that mid $20 billion range. What I want to highlight specifically is the amount of capital that they're spending over the remaining years. So you can see that in 2016, they spent about 16 billion. 2017, they spent about 15 billion. So they were definitely investing through the cycle of what was kind of going on. You can see they also had some purchases of some different organizations as well. And then in 2018, you can see that they really started ramping up total amount of investment. They had about 19 billion in terms of CapEx, and they bought about another billion, $2 billion worth of different things as well. And you can see in 2019, they did the same. They invested in and in heavily into different, different businesses, whether it was the Permian, whether that was Guyana, and I think if you just look at that, then you're going to see, well, crap, you know, what, what are they spending all this money on? And I think a lot of it is to get that cost basis down in places like Guyana and Permian so that they can really start to get and see these returns and really become a dominant force in those potential areas. So if you start looking at what's actually left over, um, so, I mean, you have your different cash flows and, and, and net cash provided from operations. And then you're utilizing a lot of this cash flow here to, to do stuff. You're not left with a lot of free cash to pay the dividend. You can see back in the day, there were about $6 billion to pay the dividend, $14 billion, $16 billion in 2018. But then when you're actually looking at the dividends paid, I mean, you're owed anywhere between 12 to $14.5 billion, $15 billion now, uh, in the trailing 12 months compared to what we were in 2016. So you've actually increased the dividend payment and dividend obligation by about 20% over the past four or five years, just by increasing the dividend heavily over the past couple of years. And what's heavily been impacted for sure is the returns that you're able to get from the business that you have. Um, I mean, you can just quickly look in this little chart here, the ability to increase revenue year over year. And with that, the earnings increased, but you can see the dip here and, you know, they didn't even make as much as they made in 2017 and 2019, even though they made a lot more in terms of total revenue. So you're going to see that the impact, the impact of the returns have been hugely hit and that is not allowing them to really keep hold of their total dividends that they have at the moment. That being said, I think that if you take into account everything and the amount of capital that they're investing into the business, I don't think they need to be spending $24, $25 billion a year. I think if they kind of bring this back down to about a 15 or a 15 billion dollar range here again, once things kind of level off with Guyana and the Permian, then I think that you have an, an opportunity to, to sustain these dividend payments for the long term. But I think what Exxon is trying to do is invest through the cycle while they have a great balance sheet, unlike a lot of their peers like BP, Shell, who have high balance sheets and took options really early to buy bigger companies 2015. Shell bought BG, BP bought BHP's onshore assets for about $10 billion in 2018 timeframe. So I think it's just an opportunity for Exxon to invest in these huge incumbent positions that they can really take to the register and really just start cashing out checks. So I think what you're looking at here is Exxon really trying to reinvent their positions in two major hubs, which is Permian and Guyana, and really start to get to the point where they can lower their cost basis and really start distributing back to shareholders for the long term. So that was really it, guys. I mean, kind of walk through specifically what Exxon is in terms of my portfolio. I'm down about 30%. I'll be transparent with you guys on that. I have about 202 shares, 206 shares, I'm sorry, where it's yielding me about 717 bucks, which is pretty cool. I'm going to use that money, reinvest it elsewhere uh, as it's currently about an 8% dividend. I'm going to take that and probably reinvest it elsewhere, or I might reinvest it back into Exxon. We will see. But that's really it, guys, and I really hope that you guys learned a little bit with respect to what's going on in the energy industry and as well as a potential investment in ExxonMobil. So 
Really appreciate your guys' time, and I'll talk to you guys on the next video. Cheers.